Welcome to the next video in the evolution series. This video will be looking at evolution of Australian biota syllabus.8.5.12, discuss current research into the evolutionary relationships between extinct species, including megafauna and extinct Australian species. So firstly, what is the difference between these terms extinct and extinct? So an extinct species is one that is no longer in existence with no living members. So an Australian example of this is obviously the Tasmanian tiger, which we know is a, uh, a species of carnivorous sort of dog type animal that became extinct quite some time ago in Tasmania. Another example is the gastric brooding frog, which is there in that second image. So extinct organisms are those that are still in existence and have or are surviving, undestroyed or remaining. So similar organisms to our extinct ones here is our Tasmanian, ta our Tasmanian devil, sorry, which we do know is endangered. However, it is, there are still uh, individuals that are, are living. And the other one is the green and gold bell frog or the green tree frog. So what is megafauna? Australian megafauna comprises of a number of large animal species. So as we can see from the picture here, this is an example of the diprotodon, and I apologise for my pronunciation of these animals as they're probably way off. And as we can see, it has um, the closest surviving relatives of this animal are the koala and the wombat. So obviously this diprotodon was an animal that was roughly the size of a car, very similar features to the wombat in terms of its body shape, also very similar to the koala in its face. So megafauna are often defined as species with a body mass estimates of greater than 30 kilograms or those that are equal to or greater than 30% body mass than their closest living relatives. So obviously if this guy here was uh, about the size of a car and weighed about a ton, obviously that is much greater than 30% of the body mass of their closest living relatives being the koala and the wombat. So where are megafauna found in Australia? So we have quite a few megafauna fossil sites that uh, you would have looked at when we did the secondary source investigation on fossil sites in Australia. And some of these include sites such as Bluff Downs in Queensland, Riversley also in Queensland, Murgon towards Southern Queensland, and Narra Court, which is on the border between South Australia and Victoria. Okay, so at these different sites, different fossils of different megafauna have been found, with some being found more than others. They've also been found in other places around Australia, but these four sites have been identified as four of the most abundant uh, locations for megafauna fossils. So what do these megafauna fossils tell us? So if we find them, you know, what, what is the purpose of them? So obviously we've looked at fossils of plants in our studies so far of the evolution topic. So in conjunction with fossils of these plants, the fossils of megafauna will allow us to know what kind of habitats existed by looking at the size of the fossils of the megafauna, especially of their teeth. So if we go back, look, thinking of the diprotodon from the previous slide, by looking at the jaw and the skull of a diprotodon, we would have been able to come to some kind of inference or conclusion that there must have been lots and lots of vegetation around when, when uh, these megafauna were roaming Australia. Obviously, because of their size, they need massive amounts of food in order to sustain their energy requirements. So that would lead us to believe that there was lots and lots of vegetation available. The locations in which the fossils are found will tell us about their distribution during their lifetime and whether this changes or not. So this could also be used to look at the changes in other environmental conditions. So as we know, Australia was once cooler, a lot more vegetation, rainforest vegetation. So where these different fossil pockets of the megafauna were found would lead us also to believe that there were these types of um, environmental conditions available there as well. Also, the fact that Australia was cooler meant that these megafauna were able to, to survive because obviously an animal of that size would need quite cool conditions, which would help us to um, understand a bit more about the Australian climate as well. 
And lastly, we're now able to, able to compare fossils of extinct megafauna to organisms that are still alive in order to compare similarities and have a look at evolutionary relationships between organisms and see whether or not there is some kind of pattern between um, natural selection that changed from those massive organisms to what we have now or whether there was some kind of other evolutionary patterns that resulted in these changes. So a couple of species that survived extinction. So if we have a look at these animals here, we can see that they are quite big. So there are species of kangaroos that are very small, such as our bush kangaroos, our rat kangaroos, but then we have the red and eastern grey kangaroos, which is still quite large. The hairy nose wombat is very similar in its size or sorry, its shape to the diprotodon, obviously not really the size. Emus cassowaries are very large birds, very tall, very long limbs, very long neck. Okay, and we'll have a look at a an extinct megafauna species that these are believed to have evolved from. Same with the goanna. There were giant lizards that existed. Obviously, our saltwater and freshwater crocodiles are considered to be living fossils because they are believed to have been unchanged for quite a long time. So obviously. Uh, in comparison to things like alligators, they are quite a deal larger, so they could cl be classified as megafauna in that case. And the southern sand octopus and miry cod, because of their size again in comparison to organisms that are very closely related to them, they could also be technically classified as megafauna. So let's quickly have a look at a relationship between extinct and extinct species. So in particular here we have the Prolopis oscillans, or oscillans, which was a giant carnivorous kangaroo that existed until about 50,000 years ago. So as we can see, it is extremely muscular. It's a little, probably a little bit hard to get, get an idea of the size of this guy because we don't really have a reference um, image to go with it. But these would have stood to be much taller than the average um, kangaroo that we have now. So a, a, a full-size male red kangaroo would probably stand shoulder to shoulder with a full, full fully grown male so these um, kangaroos would have sort of been taller and much broader as you can see much more muscular than what we know as our red kangaroos now so these guys are believed to have been related to the musky rat kangaroo so as you can see here we've talked about our musky rat kangaroos already and these are much smaller organisms that live in the underbrush or the under sort of growth of Queensland rainforest. So they're extremely small. They have much smaller limbs, uh, little eyes, darker body, and they're able to forage through the, um, the undergrowth of the rainforests. And they're obviously much going to be much quicker. So they're able to escape from predators, unlike our giant carnivorous rat kangaroo. Also, we've had a change from carnivorous kangaroos so you could imagine these guys eating smaller animals and now we know that our kangaroos are pretty much solely herbivorous animals due to the changes in the habitats that they lived in so these are some of the megafauna that ended up becoming extinct due to um, a number of different reasons that we'll have a look at so Again, apologies for my mispronunciation, no doubt of some of these. So the Wanabi Narocortensis was a giant snake. So it was a good couple of metres long, uh, huge snake that would devour um, animals the size of probably um, cows and things that we see today. The Megalania Prisca was a giant lizard. The Proc Procoptodon galia was a short-faced kangaroo, again, stood extremely tall. The Diprotodon apartum we've looked at already, so here's our sort of giant wombat slash koala type guy. The, the Thylacolio carnifex was a carnivorous cat, sort of a bit like a Tasmanian tiger, Tasmanian devil kind of thing, but obviously much bigger. And then the Dromornis street, streetoni, was a gigantic bird. So obviously we can have a look at this um, example here and see that obviously our emus and our cassowaries had to have sort of been linked to this guy evolutionarily somehow. 
So there's a number of theories for the extinction of megafauna, but the two that are most commonly accepted are climate change and human expansion. So with climate change, because of their size, the megafauna were mainly suited to glacial conditions. So we've looked at structural adaptations of organisms and know that in colder environments, animals are able to be bigger because of um, heat transfer and things like that. And in hotter environments, organisms usually reduce their surface area. So their large bodies enabled them to live in these cold conditions, obviously kept them insulated. And as Australia moved north, the temperature changed from cool to dry to warm to dry. So this obviously would have increased um, the heat that these organisms were having to deal with. And also as a result of the increased temperature and the drying up, the water sources, so rivers and lakes and things began to dry up and habitats changed. So the type of vegetation that they were um, possibly eating could have disappeared. Also, with the reduction of the rainforest and the introduction of grasslands meant that these guys were now out in the open. So they were obviously um, no longer able to hide amongst the bushes and so they would be um, visible to both predators and we're going to talk about in a second hunters, but also, as we've said, reducing um, energy requirements because of the lack of food. So human expansion uh, we saw a massive decrease in the number of megafauna uh, and eventual extinction that matches closely with the pattern of human migration into the areas where they were found. So obviously because of their size, they're very big, but they're also very slow. So it made them susceptible to hunting. So if you think you're out hunting and you see this gigantic wombat type organism and think that could feed my tribe for a month, Okay, it's not going to be able to outrun you and obviously um, they're eventually going to be killed and by killing them continuously, the numbers will decline, unable to repopulate and then we lead to distinction. So there are some megafauna that still exist in Africa because hunting was only increased slowly over there. So places where humans have become skilled hunters, in particular Australia, um, the Americas, etc., megafauna are now extinct. So um, it's really interesting to think that 50,000 years ago we had these animals that were the sizes of cars traipsing around Australia, but over time, due to the changes in the climate and the introduction of humans into different parts of Australia, unfortunately now the larger ones of these have now become extinct. And that brings us to the end of this video. So thank you for watching.